Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. I expect that everyone watching tonight is also a reader, so if you haven't already, it's time to check out Gloria Adams' Well-Read Black Girl, an online community and book club that showcases the universe of Black women's stories and experiences in and through literature. Well-Read Black Girl is also the title of Miss Adams' first book, an anthology that features a wide array of essays on topics such as gender, race, religion, and ability by writers including Jessamine Ward, Lynn Nottage, and Tyari Jones. Tonight she will she joins, sorry, tonight she joins us for the follow-up volume, a curated collection of stories entitled On Girlhood, which Philly favorite Jacqueline Woodson referred to as a loving family of writers who came before me. The book includes stories by such well-known authors as Toni Morrison, Paula Marshall, Jamaica Kincaid, and Alice Walker, as well as some shimmering newer voices you'll be excited to read. <laughs> Tonight, Ms. Adam will be in conversation with Christine Kendall, author of Riding Chance, nominated for an NAACP Image Award, and the true definition of Neva Bean, both of which are set in Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, Christine, it's great to have you here. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. So, Glory, it's so nice to be here with you. I'm so excited about this. First of all, congratulations and thank you for bringing this wonderful book into the world. You know, I've read it twice already. <laughs> And I get the feeling that this is a book that I will return to over and over again. Um, but I also wanted to congratulate you on the Well-Read Black Girls Festival, which celebrated a milestone last week. You actually had your fifth year anniversary last week. So you must feel really, really good about that. I am beyond excited. And I want to thank you and the Free Library of Philadelphia for having me. I absolutely love your library and I love Philly. So I'm excited to be joining you virtually um, and for us to be in conversation because I know you know a thing or two about Black girlhood. Um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about the book on girlhood. What inspired you to bring this book out into the world at this moment? Oh, that's an excellent question. For me, it was really focusing in on the word girl and well-read Black girl, what it means to be a young Black girl in society, what it means to be transforming and evolving, and at times have uh, misconceptions put on our identities. And mm. I wanted to look at the lens of Black girlhood through short story. And these stories are definitely um, some of my favorites. This book could have been chapters and chapters long but I had so many short stories that I wanted to you know include so narrowing it down to just 15 was challenging but um it was a mix of you know classic writers like Alice Walker and Jamaica Kincaid and then finding new voices that I felt represented the complexity and the nuance of Black girlhood so it was a real joy putting together. I can imagine. And you also wrote an introduction to the volume. And I always think it's nice to hear an author's voice. So if you, I'd really like to hear you read an excerpt from the introduction. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start on page 16. Um, I'll start now. <laughs> now my personal library is more than a collection of books. It's where my passions, anxieties, and aspirations are gathered. As a child growing up in Arlington, Virginia, I spent hours at the public library and not the bookstore. For my hardworking mother, books were too expensive to buy, but she understood their power and value. With her instruction, I went to the public library every single day after school. Very early on, I understood the importance of treating books as valuable, long lasting objects instead of disposable ones. At the library, I learned how to take good care of my community and the books I borrowed from it. I didn't bend the pages or write notes in the margins. I did my best to protect each book so it would last and be used by many people. Books were to be loved and cherished. People were to be treated with respect and approached with curiosity. Every time I read something new or made a new friend, I strengthened my imagination. I found fanciful book covers intriguing but it was the thoughtful, lively characters that kept me immersed. They beckoned me, became lifelong companions. To be honest, there were so many times I didn't want to return a library book. I wanted to keep the book forever. 
This was true the first time I read Toni Morrison's debut novel, The Bluest Eye. It's a life-changing book for many Black girls. Morrison places her reader in a position where they can empathize with the protagonist, Bacola Breedlove. She is an 11-year-old Black girl who believes that she is ugly and that having blue eyes would make her beautiful. Sensitive and delicate, she passively suffers the abuse of her mother, father, and classmates. She is lonely and imaginative. We are furious at her neglect. Morrison writes, anger is better. There is a sense of being in anger, a reality in presence, an awareness of worth. It is a lovely surging. We feel the surging and want her to be saved. Toni Morrison's groundbreaking work set the literary precedent, precedent for the in-depth study of Black girlhood. It wasn't until I was about 16 that I started to buy my own books at real life bookstores. I can still remember the two purchases that kicked off my collection, The Color Purple by Alice Walker and Jazz by Toni Morrison. The Color Purple showed me a woman's struggle for empowerment and personal liberation. The novel documents the traumas and gradual triumphs of Celie, a young black girl in rural Georgia. She narrates her life and longings through painfully honest letters to God. Jazz taught me about longing and the complicated history of the Great Migration. Immediately, the reader is confronted with the great potency of Black love and unrequited desire. Don't ever think I fell for you or fell over you. I didn't fall in love, I rose in it. I am still fixated by this line. I continued to buy my own books in high school and then into college. I read insistently, looking for answers to questions I hadn't yet asked aloud. Lots more Morrison and Walker filled my bookshelves, yet I never abandoned my love for public libraries. Whether I was in the eighth grade or entering my freshman year of college, the wonderment of the stacks enthralled me. Libraries fostered my curiosity and sustained my commitment to learning. My library filled another significant, more spiritual need. By curating my own bookshelf at home, I gave myself, to, I gave myself permission to build a sanctuary of sorts, an awe-inspiring shelf where I would spend hours discovering and dreaming about who I would become. Each book, a good faith effort to better understand my identity as a Black woman. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you're talking about the role of public libraries also hit, served my heart well because my mother used to take all six of us to the library every week and we got a book and we read it and we went back, we got another book and it's wonderful. And I, I love libraries, the smell of the books, the weight of the books and all of that. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank I mean, you. I still remember card catalogs and I mm -hmm. remember just like, you know, just the energy, as you said, the smell of being in the library yeah. and what it does for your imagination, but also what it does for your um, level of independence, you know, like the library is like a safe space for parents to kind of let the kids roam free. And so that was like Absolutely. our playground and just like, there's such great energy when you go into a public library. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's so many things to love about the collection. For instance, I'm impressed by the sheer breadth of the work in the anthology. As you mentioned earlier, you've got Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Gwendolyn Brooks, and you've also got a lot of other writers that people may be less aware of. So what was your selection process like? How did you go about determining what to include? Yeah, this was so much fun because I, I've shared this story before, but I literally had like an old school yellow, like writing pad and I wrote down like story after story. And originally I had it separated by decade. And so I was thinking of, you know, Zora Neale Hurston's short stories. I was thinking of, you know, Alice Walker, Jamaica Kincaid. And I just like wrote everything down. Zizi Packer, um, Nafisa Thomas Spears, like everyone I could think of. I just was making this long list and I was just doing it by year. And by the time I got to like the 2000s, the list was just like- I can hey, imagine. Hey, just, <laughs> oh, it was so long. Um, but as I was looking at it, I was trying to really look at the voice of the narrator and making sure that the young Black girl or the young girl going through a milestone, you know, going into womanhood, like that voice was very clear and very complicated and had nuance to it. So I wanted to kind of show um, different stages of growth. So you have some stories where they're in high school and they're dealing with very, you know, very simple, even to say childlike problems. They have crushes, 
they're, you know, they have fights in school, they're maybe they're at church and they're trying to figure out like their spirituality, maybe they're in conversation with their mother. And then when you get to the Gwendolyn Brooks, Brooks story, you know, it's, it's she's not necessarily a, a young girl, like a teenager, but she's on the the cusp of like being a newly that transitioning into like a new phase of her life. By the time you get to the end with Paul Marshall's story, you have this woman who's reflecting on her girlhood. So I was trying to really think of just like the um, the full breadth of one's experience and how we could tell a variety of coming age stories for young black girls. Right, and you, you've accomplished that so very well. I think you touched on something that I'm interested in is the sequencing of the stories. I think the sequencing in the book is, is brilliant. The collection opens with Girl by Jamaica Kincaid, which is basically a mother's prescription to her young daughter, a prescription as to how she should behave in a very traditional manner. And in that story, we hear it's the mother. There's just one line where we actually have the girl's voice but as the book uh, progresses, as you work your way through the stories, the various girls are heard loud and clear, and it's just wonderful. And their voices are voices, they're joyful, they're defiant, they're loving. For instance, I love the voice of the girl in the Camille Ecker story, who we are. So can you talk a little bit about what you hope to convey through the range of the voices and the voice in that story in particular? Yes, yeah, so I'm originally from the Washington, D.C. area, and Camille's story is all set in, in Washington, D.C., and who we are is a bunch of rambunctious, you know, <laughs> young girls on the train that they are, um, they are, you know, trying to assert their independence, but they have, they're full of such agency, and they're, you know, they're, they're making the adults feel uncomfortable, but they are comfortable in who they are, mm -hmm. and I, I loved the energy, because it reminded me of, as a young person, I didn't necessarily do those same things, but I do recall just trying to figure out who I was, and being a little bit loud on the train, or, you know, <laughs> saying a curse word or two, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and the, the girls on there, they're like, in one incident, they're they're like skipping school and they're, you know, they're kissing boys and they're like laughing loud and just being like super, just, you know, they're, they're misbehaving in right. the <laughs> work, you know what I mean? Um, but I witnessed that and now to be on the other side of it, to be an adult, to be so much older, when I see young people and they are just kind of like acting out in public, um, even when it makes me, when I'm like, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. I also see just like the freedom in it. And I can mm -hmm. see how young people every day, they're performing theater, you know, especially city kids. If, you, if you're not on the yellow school bus, you are, you have to take the subway in New York or you have to take uh -huh. the metro in DC. It's still like your, it's like your playground. You're figuring things out and you're pushing boundaries. And that story mm -hmm. for me is really about the young people pushing boundaries and see what they can can get away with what is okay and who who you know giving them their them um their own permission to be who they are you know mm -hmm. without like the gaze of the adults or the authority figures in their life they push against that um yeah. and i think that's a vital for young black girls because there are so many ideas or biases like projected on our identities on how we should behave, who should we should be, or not even seen us as young girls, seen us as women when we're 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, and they are just kind of like knocking that on its head. Yes, it's wonderful to see that. I really love that story. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. So the book is broken down into four sections, innocence, belonging, um, love, and self-discovery. So how did you decide upon that structure? Did the stories lead you to that structure or did you have those themes in mind um, when you began the project? The only theme I really had in mind from the very beginning was self-discovery because I think that is uh, in essence what coming of age is all about. Like you're discovering who you are and yourself. But then the other themes in particular, love um, and belonging really jumped out to me as I was reading the stories. And like yourself, I read these stories so many times over the last like, two years. They really became like part of like my mind. I, you know, I felt like I was like dreaming about them in my sleep. Um, and so like there were certain lines and certain like passages that were like really hit me. And I was like, you know, this is a story of belonging. You know, this is a story of motherhood. This is a story of sisterhood. Um, all these things kept coming out. So even though I was kind of a new self-discovery from the beginning, love came out. Um, and even thinking about 
more, not necessarily only romantic love, but the love we have for each other, the generosity we have for each other as sisters, as, as aunts, as mothers. Um, and like trying to figure out as you grow older where you belong and how you evolve, that also stood out to me. And so each story really has like its own like place in that. Um, and I tried to curate it. So where, wherever you're reading, whether you're like reading it from the beginning to the end, or you just pick it up and like, you know, close your eyes and like pick a story, yeah. <laughs> you would still feel that, uh, that energy and you would notice those themes. Right. And I also like the fact that within those themes, the stories were not age specific. For instance, in one of the stories, I think it's for richer for poor. Um, it's in the innocence section. And it yeah. shows that innocence is not necessarily age specific. We have these two women, uh, two sisters, right? And they're in their 60s. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about um, where they are in their lives. Yes, but it's also thank you for thank you for noticing that because there is this uh, quality of like um, looking back, right? To be mm -hmm. to be like reflective of where you've been and the choices you made, and that story was so clear to me because both sisters had lived drastically different lives, and now they found themselves together, looking like reflecting and you know just trying to decide if their choices were the, the right choices. And I think we always come to those moments in our lives, whether you you just graduated high school or you just graduated college, and you're having your quarter life crisis. I'm about to enter <laughs> uh, my 40s soon. Mm. A little bit. It's, it's coming up soon. But like, <laughs> but you know, I'm like, I'm in this moment where I'm very reflective of, like, and I just had like the five year anniversary of mm -hmm. the festival. So, right. so I've just been thinking back. So that story stood out to me because I was like, oh, wow, like these, these two sisters, they are, they love each other, you know, but they're also sisters. So there's, there's complication. And right. that, that's always, siblings, <laughs> you know, always siblings, it just happens. But it was just awesome to see how um, they could still influence one another and they can look back their lives. And in the midst of looking back, they could also still change, you know? So it doesn't matter, you know, if you, the age, if you make a decision and you feel confident about it, you can like, your life can pivot so quickly. It's like a, sh like a shift in perspective um, can happen. And often, oftentimes we need someone else to like reflect that onto us. So that was like the, the, the mean, one of the themes I saw was like, wow, they're like sisters, but they're also just like, they're, they're becoming friends in this new, you know, general, yeah. their, their new phase of their lives. Right. And the one sister is still becoming, and that's the joyful thing to see that she's still growing yes. and discovering herself. It's, it's really, it's another really nice story, right? <laughs> So within the anthology there, I noticed some common themes or, or common threads that ran throughout the stories like mothering and mm -hmm. identity and vulnerability and yep. empowerment. But there was also a strong sense of spirituality throughout the stories. So can you talk a little bit about the role of spirituality in the collection? Yeah, I felt like the, um, again, my process really tends to be intuitive. Like I really feel like if it makes me cry or makes me laugh or it just gives me a pause, I hope that um, the reader will have a similar experience. And in terms of like spirituality, the story that really led me into that direction was Rita Dove's story um, where, you know, the young girl is in, in church and she's also, she has this moment with, without giving too many spo spoilers, but she, <laughs> she faints and she, she, you know, she has this moment where she's like considering who she is and um, the people around her in this church. And I thought it was so clever because it, it's, it was like this moment where this young girl, tried, she she has a crush and she's trying to figure out who she is, but she's also like questioning God and, and mm -hmm. like think, you know, asking like for some kind of direction on, you know, who, who she should become or who, what direction she, she, her life is going in. And I think that that's like a common theme for every young person when you're trying to decide like how how am I going to exist in the world? You know, people often have these existential crises and they're going to, you know, they're praying or maybe they feel like their prayers aren't being answered, but it's like, we all have those moments and it's less about like an institution or a religion. It's more about um, the spirit, you know, and, and being intuitive and like following your, your heart, your calling, um, and also pushing against systems. So Shay Youngblood's story does something similar where they're in a church and the, the, the preacher says something that is like unsavory and, and it's like, okay, like do, 
do we have to listen to these institutions or can we create our own ideas and our own ideologies that nurture us and cultivate mm -hmm. community? Um, so I, I thought that was really interesting to kind of explore. And I don't necessarily have an answer for it, but I think it's an awesome thing to investigate and ask questions about and be in dialogue about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like spirituality takes so many different forms and, um, and, and I, I, I'm a Christian myself, but I, I'm not pushing any ideology on anyone, but I am interested on how we come together as community to talk about um, the universe and God and, and like those big, those big questions that seem to come up in every type of literature. Right. Yes. And there were many opportunities to consider those sorts of things throughout the book. It was just terrific. Oh, so, and I you. want to talk a little bit about the epilogue because you've got these stories, these short stories, and then there's this very powerful essay by Zora Neale Hurston, and the book actually ends with that essay. So, talk to me about how you chose that essay for the ending oh, yeah. of the book. So, I um, I mentioned the introduction. I like so many Black women. I love Zora Neale Hurston. I love her yeah. voice. I love her audacity, just mm -hmm. how she was so fearless. When I think about the time period she grew up in and the challenges, challenges she had to face as a Black woman and how she still showed up so big and powerful and her writing was um, completely just full of her, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was going through all of her stories and I was like, oh, I want... I want to put in a short story by Zornel Hurston, but I didn't know which one to pick. There's just like right. so many. <laughs> and, and, um, and then I came across this essay and it had that one line about, you know, her girlhood, like her really speaking to her girlhood. And I was like, this is it. Like this is a, it's also another controversial, maybe unexpected essay to put in the book, but I, again, I love that kind of juxtaposition where things are not seemingly uh, together they don't seem like they match mm -hmm. but they do because a it's Sonia Hurston wherever she yes. is she belongs everywhere you know but but her actually speaking to her girlhood and speaking to yeah. um her boldness and uh how she knew who she was even at that young age you know uh, and I thought it was such such a beautiful reminder even if you do not agree with Sonia Hurston that you still have to respect her um her position in the world and how she was able to make a way out of no way essentially Absolutely. When I read that essay, I felt like she was running towards her blackness. It, it was just, she accepted herself so fully and knew who she was. It was yes. so inspiring. Yeah, it, it is so inspiring. And it's just mm -hmm. like, wow, like, you know, we have, um, it's the year 2021. We have so many resources. Look at us. We're on Zoom, you know, <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> we have so many things at our disposal. And I don't think many people have the boldness of Zora Neale Hurston mm -hmm. and she did not have as much access did not have as much privilege as, as much money but she still was so firm in who she is and I think it's like such a timeless reminder of like being firm you know, having your values and be steady on your own two feet and mm -hmm. that will never steer you wrong no matter what challenges you face like it you have to be authentic and you have to be yourself and I when I look at her life um and I study her work that comes through so clearly. And um, I, wanted, I wanted that to be a reminder to the reader to just respect that and to, to go forward with that, especially given, um, especially being a Black woman. I just can't like re, like re, re emphasize that enough. It's just like, it is very challenging. And I think that we need that reminder as much as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. So I noticed that many of the stories are open-ended, meaning that there's no real resolution to them at the end. And that felt right to me because a lot of the protagonists were going through uh, this coming of age period where, which can be exhilarating, but also quite frightening. And you're, you're questioning, you're questioning everything. Um, so the fact that the stories weren't all tied up at the end felt right because that feels like that's the way life is yeah. very often so uh, were you intentional in choosing those stories that were somewhat open-ended yes I did and that's another reason why at the end of each story there's like discussion questions that people can continue to unpack them and mm -hmm. you know figure out their own meaning for the story and try to interpret interpretate um what 
the author is trying to express. Yeah, I, yeah, you really said it. Like, I do feel like life is that way. Like I've, I've had like such a doozy of a, of a week with the, the virtual festival, but you know, in, in one hand, there's like incredible things happening. And then the other hand, there can be challenging things happening. And like, that's like life, you know, there's just like so many things constantly happening at the same time. And I think those, the stories, you know, short, a short story is such a beautiful, um, it's such a beautiful genre because it doesn't, you, again, it comes down to sentences, like sentences in a short story are so powerful and meaningful. And also you get a um, purview into the character. It's like, because it's less about plot and more about the, um, right, right. You know, the inner dialogue, the, you know, mm-hmm. what's happening in the character's mind, the choices they're making and why. Um, and that's what I was going for. I really wanted you to get a better understanding of the interior of each person that you were reading about. Mm-hmm. And speaking about short stories, um, a lot of people may not realize that Toni Morrison wrote short stories as well as her novels. And I believe the short story in the collection is her one short story that she actually published. But can you talk a little bit about what brought you to that short story or how you found it? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I I love anthologies. It's part of my archive and how I study and how I learn about the classics. So one of the anthologies I have is um, done by Amiri Baraka and his mm-hmm. ex-wife. I can, oh, I'm going, I see the cover in my head. I'm going blank <laughs> on his, his, it was his first wife. It was on his second wife. They did the anthology together mm-hmm. and it's called Communion. Uh, so oh. if anyone wants to look that up <laughs> to, uh-huh. and, and tell me the name in the chat, how I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, but I was reading communion and I came across that story and I, I had a bookmark for a while. I wanted to figure out how I could use it, um, in a future book or an, another project. And, uh, when I came, you know, came to this idea, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Cause not only is it two young girls, but it really follows them, um, through this, like through into adulthood, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of theme from young girl to adult, all the things that change, all the things that happen to you that really shape your being. Um, and I also want to pay tribute to Morrison, who is just, you know, the queen mother, mm-hmm. she's no longer here with us. So it's such, it's so bittersweet because her work lives on through all of us, but, um, I would have loved to, you know, be in conversation with her or show her, you you know, really show her like all, you know, my work in a powerful way, but I'm so grateful for her influence and she shows up in everything. And I look at truly everything that I'm working towards and the people that I work with so many incredible authors. It's, I feel like every day we're paying homage to her work. Um, Mm -hmm. And that story is so brilliant. It's like, it's just, it's like a master on her just her craft how she tells story how you pull people in and how it, again it gives you questions that story leaves you with more questions than answers yes yes absolutely so this is probably an unfair question but i'm going to pose it anyway <laughs> do you have a favorite story in the collection <laughs> oh, it's like your children you can't right pick, you, you can't know? Just, right you know but i i will say that tony morrison's story is definitely up there you know yeah. I would, like I, and, and then i also like love to make a Kincaid story just like you know two class I mean they're all they're all so great like, they're, they're all, all wonderful they're all, they all have, yeah. they all speak to you differently but they're yeah. all terrific I think one of my favorites um is Melvin in the sixth grade right so <laughs> Melvin in the sixth grade is so good about, yeah Dana Johnson is brilliant. And yeah. again, like going through different generations and time periods. So I mean, Melvin in the sixth grade, like it's just, it's really about this young girl who has a crush and also her trying to assimilate in a new environment and, you know, mm-hmm. be cool, you know, trying to like figure out like um, where she stands, where she, when she's, when she has to make a big decision, like mm-hmm. she's going to be defend this person or is she going to go on her own will that make her like be unaccepted that theme yeah. of belonging you know comes up mm-hmm. um you know also like young love like when you're in the sixth grade and you feel like you love someone like what does that mean you know um yeah I just love Dana Johnson and I think sometimes oh. perspective of a of a young person mm-hmm. you know 
And what's that like? Because I feel like reading her, I was immediately like transported into middle school again, like those angst and anxiety that I felt as a young person. I through her writing, I could see it so clearly and I could feel the the awkwardness, you know. Um, but I think that is such a special skill to be able to, you know, really figure out how to write in a young person's voice without sounding mm-hmm. like an adult. <laughs> oh, right. And she did it very, very well. I felt mm-hmm. like I was right there with her in yeah. the schoolyard, right? <laughs> right, right. There, there are, because it's more, it's less about um, even like the language, but again, like that feeling, like how do you mm-hmm. capture that feeling? How, so how do you do that? Do you have a way of like, are you listening to young people on the bus? <laughs> That's, well, yeah, I do do a lot of eavesdropping when I'm walking down the street or on the trolley, you know, here in West Philly, whatever. I'm listening to people's conversations because you do want to get the feel, the, the, that rhythm. You don't necessarily want to try to use uh, the slang that they're using because you probably won't be able to do it correctly. And also slang changes so quickly, but it's just, um, I guess if I, my feeling is, you know, I was eight years old at one point myself and and in many ways I may still be there. (laughs) So it's it's not so hard to go back to that voice. It's just sort of, you know, remembering what the issues were that you were dealing with and sometimes they're not so different from what you're dealing with now, you know, still issues of vulnerability and identity and, and all of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it's so great. I mean, I, I absolutely love hearing and now that I'm a mom too. I'm just like, my son isn't talking yet, but, um, when he does, I'm just going to be like, what is, you oh, know, like, what's absolutely. going on? That's going to be just listening, right. To the first words and what's going on. Yeah. What's your son's name? Zeke. Very beautiful. All right. <laughs> well, we could go on and on, but maybe we should at this point turn to some questions. We have a few questions from yeah. our listeners. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Um, oh, yes. So how, did, here's the first question. So how did you scoop Toni Morrison's own publisher by including her short story in your selection? Great story. Thanks for including it. <laughs> that's that's funny that's funny um well I don't I didn't know that they were publishing it so (laughs) I'm happy I did scoop it it, but um yeah I mean I'm I don't know I don't know how that happened I'm really excited that I'm part of that uh I got first dibs but yeah it wasn't intentional per se but um (laughs) I'm glad yeah. you did too, because I knew she had published a short story, but I hadn't read it. And I'm really glad I did. Yeah. So I get, cause it's a short story. So is it just a slim volume? I'm guessing, I guess they're only publishing that one. Yes. Little... I don't know the details surrounding that. Yeah. So we have another question for Brian. He's asking, did you also write the questions at the end of each story? They're really helpful, especially as I reread the stories. They're all worth rereading. And I agree with Brian. (laughs) Thank you for that. I was, you know, I was, um, I was debating if I should put questions, but I did want to kind of say truth to the book club feel. And uh, anyone who follows Well Read Black Girl has gone to a book club knows I am. I love asking questions. I love being like, I don't know this. What do you think? You know, that is definitely like the ethos of our community to ask a lot of questions and to be in dialogue and also to be in discourse. Like sometimes we debate and totally disagree <laughs> when it comes to some <laughs> stories and some characters. Um, but yes, I, I did write them with my editor. It was a team effort and we really were thoughtful and thought about the reader, whether it was a young person and in, in school or you know, you know, working with your professor, or if it was an everyday reader who was on the subway with this book open and wanted to kind of explore further um, with the characters. So yeah, it was very intentional. So I'm glad that uh, you are having a good experience. Thank you. So we have another question from Dr. Lloyd. Uh, this is wonderful. Could you please mention the details of the Amara Baraka Leroy Jones story or book you referenced? Yes, I will find it for, um, if my bookshelf was a little bit closer, I would pull it up. Let me see if I can find it. I'm pretty sure it's called Communion. Um, Let me see. Let me see, I'll have to do 
some digging. It's an anthology and pretty, it's, I, I'm sure it's out of print, but I was able to mm. find, oh, you know what? It's not communion, it's confirmation. I found confirmation. it. Confirmation, okay. Yes, I knew it was a C. Yes, let me, I, I found, I'm finding it, I'm finding it. It was published in 1983 by Harper's Collins. And if I can, I'm going to look up one more thing. Let me see if I can find a cover of it for you. Okay, so I was, I was able to find it on World Cat, on World Cat. So I want to put this in the chat for everyone. Great, thank you. Yes. Okay, yes. we're going to move on to the next question from Tracy. Hi, what or who guided you, especially as a child, to the powerful authors you read? Also, did you know to search other libraries for books that weren't widely available? Thank you for your book. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And I, my mother was a huge influence on my like reading and my library searches. And um, next to that, I will say my experience at Howard University, I was able to be in a first class library with you know, incredible archives really sit at the feet of so many of the ancestors that attended my alma mater. So, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, of course. Um, yeah, I just, I, I've always been a really curious person. And um, when I was younger, I, I really thought that was like not a, a good quality, like being so kind of like going down all these rabbit holes. But as I got older, um, I noticed that that quality uh, allowed me to be um, not get deterred. You know, like I didn't get bored easily or I didn't get distracted. I would just be able to kind of like follow these threads and discover something new. And even if you look at my resume, I've done a lot of different things. And, you know, for the average person that'd be like, oh my gosh, like what, well, you know, how were you able to do, you know, work at a startup and then publish a book and do all these, or, you know, or, or work at a theater. And it's all of those things were just kind of allowing me to follow my curiosity and being okay with, uh, not having like a firm ending, if that makes kind of like right. this book. Like I'm okay, I'm okay with a little bit of uncertainty or taking risks because I like the adventure. I really believe in the mantra, you know, trust the journey. Um, and it's thus far, it's been it works it's worked to my benefit. It's allowed me to have some wonderful experiences. Um, and that's the best thing, especially when you're looking at archives. Like if you go into the Schomburg or if you go mm -hmm. into any archive, quite honestly, like you never know what you're going to find. Like you really have to sit with things and read them slowly and be intentional. Um, and just that like leads you to so many treasures. So um, even this book that I just shared, which I apologize for getting the name wrong uh, initially, it is, um, it is confirmation, but um, the that was me. I was just like reading so many, I was like reading anthologies. I was just like going through them and I came across that. And his wife's name is Amina Baraka. That's, that was his first wife. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's kind of just been my, my experience. It's like reading diligently. And when I go, and then when I do like one author, like for example, uh, th this last year, I was like, I want to read like all of Edgewich Danny Cat's work. Like I've, I've read it before, but I decided to like do it all in order. So yeah. I did like Crick Crack. I did, um, uh, I did um, Creating Dangerously. Like I read every single book she's read in the last like 10 years. Yeah, you know, her new short story collection. And I just like yeah. read it back to back. So I do a lot of like rereading <laughs> of things and try to do it in order. Like yeah. there's been times where, okay, I, like I'm going to read all of Morrison again. So I'll do Beloved, I'll do Sula and I'll do an order and I'll like read with a different intention versus like the first time I read it was just out of kind of enjoying flowing. So it's like, okay, let me like now study the sentences. I mean, kind of like look at the themes differently. Like how do I feel as I'm reading it all together? Am I seeing connections in my journal? Like usually, and then the second time I reread something, I usually journal, I write in the margins more, you know? So I, I like that. I like the process of it. Um, and I don't know if that's like a normal thing or not, but I do enjoy that kind of um, intentional gathering of information and not necessarily for it with no end product, you know, like sometimes, mm -hmm. yes, I'll share it on this platform, but really it's for my own personal cultivation. Right. It's wonderful to be curious and to, you know, to enrich yourself. It's, I think yeah. that's a good thing. 
Yeah. It's like kind of like, I imagine some people play instruments and you're not, you know, you're not playing in uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, like, right. not every, <laughs> like, it's like you do it because you like to play the piano or you like right. to paint because it just like nourishes you and it gives you like, you know, I, I really now, you know, well, we're black girl is part of my livelihood and my entrepreneurship, but, you know, initially it really was just something I like, like most people I'm doing it for fun. I'm doing it to learn. I'm doing it to see how I can just be a better person and what I can learn. Um, so that's how, I think I answered your question. I feel like right. I went on a little bit of a tangent. It's wonderful just to hear you talk about your curiosity and your process and, and where you've gone with the book club and the festival. So, so um, don't apologize. <laughs> Um, next question from Heidi. Do you have a vision for how this work might be used in schools, with whom, by whom, and any caveats or advice, especially given the current political context? Mm, that's a great question. I am steady on the fact that I want um, the work of Black women and people of color to really be at the forefront of our, um, our literary, like, I want to I want to say canon that's just like this idea of rematching the literary canon is always stuck in my head like I mm -hmm. loved reading Little Woman growing up and I loved you know To Kill a Walking Bird I read all those books um, and they deserve to be there too but they also need to be in conversation with other books and this is not a new statement the idea of having diversity in schools um, within our literature and all of our subjects is so crucial so I see this in that space of just opening up um, the, the narratives that young people read and allowing them to investigate them thoroughly. And also in a lot of regards, using them to correct the historical record, this idea that there hasn't been any voices from young black girls and women uh, and non-binary people is, is mm. false. And uh, by using fiction and using memoir and just using text to kind of introduce these new ideas um, and do so in a way that isn't um, isn't forced upon students. I like the idea of students having their own agency and picking the, the stories that they mm -hmm. want to explore and ask questions about. I was able to talk to some young people earlier in the week and they had incredible questions and they had such insight that I know when I was in high school, I was... I wasn't there, you know, they have such a richer vocabulary and they're able to challenge things and, and know where, um, where they want, want to be in the world, you know? Uh, so I hope my book, it just expands upon that. And I really hope it gives people just, um, and that's another reason why I put the questions in and I have the long list of book recommendations at the back because there isn't any excuse for people to say, I didn't know this existed or, you know, where, like, where can I find more? There's the internet, there's JSTOR, there's, there's, right. um, you know, there's the library and there's also my book. There's so many resources and with enough, you know, digging and curiosity and asking enough questions, you'll find the answer. So I'm, right. um, I'm excited and I want there to, I do intend to create more anthologies and I'm working on a memoir project now that really focuses on mm -hmm. my, Nigerian heritage and my love for reading and the idea of duality and identity um, and how books impact that. So um, yeah, I just want all my books to always like spark conversation, you know, whether good or bad, I just want people to talk and have, you know, ideas exchanged. I can absolutely see that happening as a result of that book. It's really, really exciting. Um, so we'll move on to Joanne's question. Did anything stand out for you as a common theme throughout the stories? Oh, yeah. I think the idea of um, the complexity of Black womanhood and Black girlhood and how it can be, um, it can be really fraught. You know, there's mm -hmm. like, I think, you know, throughout time, you know, reading Dornell Hurston's story where you feel not a misunderstood or undervalued is a common theme and trying to push yourself and affirm yourself despite the obstacles that you face. Um, I, that was definitely something that I saw like a story after story, this uh, assertion of self, this, this, uh, this needing of self-compassion and self-trust and self-love uh, where you have to find that from within with order because the outside world is not gonna not validate that or give you that. Um, and so that, that was something I, I found pretty common throughout the whole collection. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question from Rosa. Uh, and you may have spoken to this a little earlier. Do you plan to continue publishing more anthologies under the well-read Black Girl brand? And if so, what books do you envision down the line? Yeah, I'm working on some things now. You know, we're working on um, like a series and I would like to do a similar version of this focusing on black motherhood. Um, and I think motherhood is such a special uh, subject because mothering comes in all forms. You know, it doesn't only mean one who gives birth but mothering of movements. I think of Fannie Lou Hamer, mothering of, of children, mothering of just uh, of our, our communities and like the earth, like there just is, so many different ideas on how we take care of each other. Um, so I'd, I would like to explore that further. I'm also really intrigued by, um, it's given the, the political landscape currently, just uh, political movements and, and speeches written by Black women. Um, we were talking about the, like the earlier about the library and mm -hmm. you know, going into the archive. I've definitely visited a number of archives and I found, you know, amazing speeches written by black women over the decades that I feel like would be, you know, incredible to share, shine a light on in a book and put all together and see the connections and the themes there. Um, yeah. So I have a lot of ideas that I'm slowly trying to put together. Um, and I'm really thankful to my publisher. They're, they're amazing. So I'm, I'm glad this was able to come together, especially during this pandemic. Of, <laughs> it's been so challenging, as you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. trying to do virtual events and share the word with everyone. But it's awesome that folks are coming out and supporting um, as we do things online. Absolutely. This has been so much fun chatting with you. So again, I'm going to encourage everyone, if you haven't already got your copy, rush. What is it? Run, don't walk <laughs> to Uncle Bobby's and get your copy of On Girlhood. You definitely will not be sorry. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Lord, it's so you wonderful. So much. Yes. And thank you to everyone. This has been terrific. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate right. it. Have a good Love night. Guys, Billy. Good night. <laughs>